like to welcome everybody today to the Ignite Talk, the last and final Ignite Talks of this conference, Climate Culture Peace. We're calling this at the forefront of culture, heritage, and climate. With my wonderful panel speakers, we are going to try to find a spark as the world races to respond to climate change, methods for connecting culture and heritage with climate change are evolving fast as well. These talks are going to show us some of the innovations that are underway. And we need to find out together what other innovations do we need to know of and what other kind of innovations are needed. Where are we heading? We're trying to form these connections and how are we going to bridge the gap between culture, peace and climate action? With that, it is my pleasure to introduce our first Ignite talk by Ms. Anne Grady. She's the head cultural heritage advisor at the EU Commission, currently based in Brussels, originally from Ireland. She was a senior manager with the National Museum of Ireland and since May 2016 works as a seconded national expert with the cultural policy unit of DGEAC and played a key role with the management of the European Year of Cultural Heritage 2018 with a reach of over 12 million. She led a member state working group on the subject of sustainable cultural tourism, and she's now leading a second working group on strengthening cultural heritage resilience for climate change. She will also be sharing uh, a bit about this report with us, and she is going to present strengthening cultural heritage resilience for climate change. And the floor is yours. Thank you very much. And um, I think you're going to share my presentation Absolutely. for me. Thank yeah. you. OK. And um, I'm delighted to be here. And good morning to everybody. And thank you to the British Council and to the Department of Digital Culture, Media and Sport, and also to ICRAM for this organization. If I could have my yes. first slide. And this is always the tricky part. Okay. Okay, thank you. So I'm going to talk about strengthening cultural heritage resilience for climate change. And that brings me on to my next slide. So thank you again to the organizers. And I thought it was very appropriate to start with an image of um, a historic kitchen fire because this is a, an Ignite talk. So I thought this was kind of uh, relevant and appropriate. And it's also an indication of intangible cultural heritage. And it's from a historic house outside Graz in Austria. And my next slide. So talking about the EU commission and a lot of people say that cultural heritage and climate change, it's, it's all very, very it's new. But the Commission um, has a number of different research projects and programs, and some of them, such as Noah's Ark, go right back to 2004, over 18 years ago. So I've given an indication here of the various different uh, research programs that have been funded, and also other funded projects. I think it's also important to remember that under Horizon Europe, there's going to be 33 million invested in culture and climate change under the very first work program. So my next slide, please. So where do I fit in in all of this? The Council Work Plan for Culture, and this is a plan that's conducted every four years. So there are six priorities in the plan, and I'm working on the very first one, the one that's highlighted there, sustainability in cultural heritage. And overall, the plan has 18 actions over four years. My next slide. So under that priority, there's an OMC group. What is? an OMC group. It's an open method of coordination group and it's a form of soft law and it brings together the member states to look at a particular subject and this subject is cultural heritage and climate change and the mandate for the group because we're working in under an agreed mandate says um, in particular refers to SDG 13 take urgent action now to combat climate change and its impact. The title of the group is the title of this presentation, Strengthening Cultural Heritage Resilience for Climate Change. And there's huge and growing interest in this particular group. Um, as I gave a presentation at COP26 last November, also at the G20 and at various different uh, fora and conferences. 
In the group, we have experts who are each nominated by their member state or country. And we have 25 altogether plus three, um, Norway, Switzerland and Iceland. And they're a real dedicated, enthusiastic group of people with a huge amount of knowledge and expertise. And I thought it was very relevant from one of our first meetings to give a quote from the group, um, one of the group members, and it was culture. It actually brings people together. It leads to social cohesion, peace, and a sense of well-being for all. And that's why it matters. And this leads me very neatly onto the next slide. What are we doing within the group? Our objectives, identifying and exchanging good practices and innovative measures. We're looking at the current and emerging uh, threats and impacts of climate change. But also we're going to look at what contribution can cultural heritage make to mitigate and combat climate change? What can we learn from cultural heritage? And this is all under the umbrella of the European Green Deal. So it's the outcomes will lead to awareness raising, capacity building, and we're going to produce a set of recommendations. And this will lead on to further discussions and also to planning of climate change measures at European and national level, and hopefully in the broader context, the context and in the broader world. And this leads on to my next slide. What we've done so far, we've had a questionnaire and uh, amongst our members, amongst the 28 countries, and we've looked at the um, data that's out there, which is mostly on immovable heritage, very little on intangible heritage. We've looked at what are the threats, precipitation, heat waves, droughts, sea level rise. And also we've identified there's a lack of policy tools for resilient built heritage. And many uh, national adaptation plans don't consider cultural heritage. It doesn't have cultural heritage weaved into them. We're collecting case studies uh, of both tangible and intangible cultural heritage of best practice. And we've broken down into four working groups, renovation, energy efficiency and mitigation, cultural heritage, climate change adaptation, research and innovation. And then again, awareness raising, education, training and policy development, all very key in this debate and in this challenge that we're facing with climate change and all interlinked, they're not in separate boxes. My next slide. Our timeline, the mandate, it was agreed under the German presidency and we had our first meeting last year. We've had five meetings all together. We've got our sixth meeting next week and we hope by quarter two of this year, we'll have the recommendations and final report completed. Next slide. So why are we doing all this? We're safeguarding cultural heritage for future generations. And that's so important to pass, pass cultural heritage on safely. And I thought a quote from Helen Keller is really, really relevant here. Alone, we can do so little. Together, we can do so much. And this brings me on to my next slide, just to mention that this year, is the European Year of Youth 2022. And this um, is the year focusing on youth. And also the youth have a huge role to play in climate change. And there's a huge awareness out there. And we're taking that into account in our report. Next slide. Here is uh, additional information, the new European Bauhaus. There's also another OMC running at the moment on cultural dimension of sustainable development. And that report will be available at the end of the year. The council conclusions in October last year uh, concerning NDCs. There's a report finalized on architecture. We have the ICOMAS uh, quality principles, sustainable cultural tourism report, and the European cultural heritage green paper. So all those links will be provided and my presentation will be circulated afterwards. So next slide. Thank you very, very much. Merci and Gura Mahaga. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Anne, for that wonderful presentation. And I do agree, um, we have seen a lot of action in the conference itself from the youth side. And I think it's such a wonderful initiative. Uh, we do need to start bringing in more young people, the people whose shoulders the responsibilities are going to be carried on in the future, who are going to face the impact. So this would be great uh, also to know further when we're going to have a chance to see the report, if it's going to be available to all. Um, 
And also I would encourage everybody to kindly put in their questions for Dr. Anne and for all of our other speakers in the chat, and we will address them towards the end of the session. So thank you very much thank again. Thank you. Thank you. A wonderful presentation. Moving on, we have our next um, talk by Dr. Veronica Bullock. She, is, she holds a degree in prehistory, archaeology, and material conservation, and has worked in curatorial and conservation roles in major Australian collecting organizations. She established the Heritage Consultancy Significance International to undertake projects in a range of areas, including significance and risk assessment. Her 2020 doctorate in investigates the history, meaning, and effectiveness of heritage and sustainability policymaking by the Australian government. Today, Dr. Veronica will be sharing with us Climate Change is Orange. The floor is yours. Thank you, Joey. Um, have you received my PowerPoint? Yes. Um, would before? you prefer for us to share that? Could you, please? Of course. Um, let great. me bring it up. There we go. There we go. Okay. All good? Thank you. Thank you, Raji. Was there something? No? Okay. Next slide, please. In 1972, a team of 17 scientists was commissioned to simultaneously analyze five variables at global scale. The consumption of non-renewable natural resources, food production, industrialization, pollution, and population. Most of the 12 scenarios they produced for the future of humanity were pessimistic. People were shocked. They blamed poor early skills in multivariate analysis. Analysis of the same variables by many others using real rather than theoretical data has since proven the limits to growth to be roughly correct. That is, the most probable result will be a rather sudden and uncontrollable de decline in both population and industrial capacity by the mid to late 21st century. For example, check out the work of Australian scientist Graham Turner, who has tested the findings using 30 and 40 years of real data. Things still don't look good for, hu for humanity, by 2100. Next slide, please. In the wake of such work and increasing societal concern about the future, the UN commissioned an independent panel in 1983 to thoroughly investigate the topic. The resulting report from 1987, not 1986, I apologize, Our Common Future, also known as the Brunton Report after its chair, is most cited for its definition of sustainable development as, quote, development that meets the needs of the present without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their own needs. Next slide, please. One of the first headings in this report is interlocking crises. My red underlining highlights their thesis that, quote, these are not separate crises, an environmental crisis, a development crisis, an energy crisis. They are all one. 
The Bruntman report is extensive and discursive, and to my mind, its interlocking crises were best distilled in 1994 into seven sorts by Australian ecologist and policy academic Stephen Dovers. Next slide, please. In 2013, Dovers plotted four definitions of environment in literature and policy between the 1960s and 2010s. He reminded us that in the 1960s and 70s, environment was concerned with abating certain types of pollution and conserving plants and animals in reserves. By the 1980s, environmental and natural resource management methods were developed to address urgent water, soil and forest issues. He observed that environmental science, economic science and policy cooperation increased dramatically in the 1980s, not least due to the Brundtland Report. By the late 80s, the main frame for environment in Australia, at least, became ecologically sustainable development. We don't have ordinary sustainable development in Australia, we have this variety. With its emphasis on the crisis of biodiversity loss. Dovers finished his survey with the finding that the crisis of climate change has dominated the political agenda since the mid 2000s. Should we let semantic fashions determine our collective fate? And why do we hear so little about the precautionary principle anymore? To paraphrase the 1992 Rio Declaration, that is, where there are threats of serious or irreversible damage, lack of full scientific certainty shall not be used as a reason for postponing cost-effective measures to prevent degradation, and I add, of any kind. Next slide, please. In the 21st century, I suggest that Western and Northern societies comprehend the interconnectedness of everything better than before, but only by building on such careful heritage thinking as presented here and the knowledges of excluded cultures. Let us now find ways of reconnecting the many 20th century compartments of science with the sidelined humanities from the red end of the spectrum right through to the violet end to reset our minds and fates with no more ado. Last slide, please. Um, Dr. Bullock? Yes. Oh, oh we... finished. Yeah. I hope it didn't take too much longer than five minutes. No. <laughs> Absolutely not. That was uh, quite wonderful. And it was very inspiring to hear that there are people now talking about these interlinked crises, that everything that is happening right now and the actions we need to take now are not a singular action. It's not the responsibility of a climate scientist. It's not the responsibility of one particular community, but we need to come together and uh, have an integrated response. So thank you for such a wonderful talk. Um, we will, uh, again, for Dr. Veronica, if you have any questions, please do use our chat and we will get to it as soon as uh, all of our other talks are done. Fine. Thank you. Thank you. It is now my pleasure to introduce our next speaker, Dr. Mr. Rob Woodside. Rob Woodside is the Director of Conservation at English Heritage and is responsible for the management and maintenance of over 400 ancient monuments and historic buildings. 
He is also the chair of UK Historic Environment COP26 Climate and Heritage Task Group and is the author of Heritage Response, Taking Positive Actions on Climate Change. He's a guest lecturer on heritage, environmental sustainability, and climate change at the UCL Institute of Sustainable Heritage, and a specialist assessor to the British Council Culture Protection Fund grant applications for heritage-led projects in Iraq, Turkey, Lebanon, and occupied Palestinian territories, as well as risk preparedness and climate change action in Kenya, Uganda, and Tanzania. Mr. Woodside will be talking to us about how heritage response and taking positive action on climate change. The floor is yours, Mr. Woodside. Thank you, Jay. Would you mind bringing up my slide deck, please, if you can? Uh, of course, you'll let me do. Thank you. Coming up. All right. Is it working? Otherwise, I'll, I'll do it at my end. No. Here we are. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I'm just going to make sure I've got my notes. So bear with me, please. So, um, so I want to very briefly talk to you about our work in Heritage Responds. Um, a little bit of background, what the Historic Environment Forum is, it's a network of uh, UK government and not-for-profit organisations who work together to find solutions to challenges facing the heritage sector. And we believe there's no other single issue that requires us to work more closely together than climate change. So last year, uh, ahead of COP26 in Glasgow, we established a new task group aimed at highlighting not only the challenges we face on climate change, but to showcase the very many positive actions we're already taking to address the issue. So the group, which comprised uh, my organisation, English Heritage, National Trust, Historic England, actually and lots of different partners working together, um, knew that in order to cut through the noise and clamour of COP26, we needed to focus and demonstrate means of which we can work together for heritage and culture to become part of the solution. We knew good words and statements were not enough. There are plenty of um, fantastic manifestos and declarations out there. We didn't think we needed another one. We needed, what we needed was evidence to show that heritage and culture can make a positive contribution to the climate debate and that we're already doing it. Uh, we put out a call for case studies that demonstrated how heritage organization responding to the climate crisis and actually we're quite astonished by the wealth of practical action already being undertaken. Um, but alongside action, we found collaboration, innovation, advocacy, initiatives to build knowledge, grow skills, and truly engage with local communities. So Heritage Response, which was launched days before COP26, therefore captures a moment in time and a mood for change. It demonstrates the extent to which the sector has moved in recent years, uh, understanding the potential risks from climate change and playing its part in reducing the impacts on operation. It also argues that heritage and culture has a positive role to play um, in supporting communities mitigate and adapt to climate change. Far from being a barrier to change, heritage can, may be a unifying and galvanizing force for positive action. Next slide, please. We all now acknowledge that climate change is one of the biggest threats facing the historic environment. We're all strongly aware of the potential impacts of climate change in the places we value. We know an increasing amount about the potential damaging impacts of that higher sea levels, increased flooding, storm damages, droughts and temperatures have on historic buildings and landscapes, archaeological sites, and marine heritage, gardens, parklands. We know the impacts will happen on people's homes and property, on towns facing increased flooding, on coastal and rural communities. So learning how to manage and protect heritage will always be a priority for us. I'm personally uh, closely involved in dealing with the consequences of coastal erosion and sea level rise here at Hearst Castle, an English heritage property that experienced a major collapse last year as a protective foreshore was washed away after years of attrition and winter storms. We're not only having to deal with the impact of the collapse, but ask some pretty major questions about the future of the castle. Can we, should we continue to protect it, given the climate scenarios indicate up to one metre of sea level rise by the end of the century? There's certainly much to be learned from Hearst, so look out for more announcements coming shortly on that. 
But we also need to look beyond protection towards facilitation, working from crisis to action, because I believe we can make a difference. We need to find ways of not only protecting uh, and adapting the places we value, but utilizing heritage as a means to support society in meeting the challenge of climate change. So as said, far from being a barrier to mitigation, adaptation, culture and heritage can offer solutions. Because heritage and culture matter, people love it, they respond to it, they debate it. Um, it's all around us in our landscapes, buildings, communities. It forms the background of our everyday lives in cities, towns and countryside across the nation, across the world. Thousands of jobs in tourism, hospitality, construction depend on it. COVID aside, millions of people visit heritage sites every year, generating billions in tourism revenue from the global economy. Regenerating urban areas this brings further investment and pride in town centres. Historic buildings and landscapes are often habitats, protected species and act as green lungs to towns and cities. The point I'm making here is this is not niche stuff. This is absolutely core to the world we live in, around, we live in and um, the, the future that we face. And culture and heritage offers insight to how people lived in the past and shaped the world around them. This knowledge and appreciation how it shaped our social and cultural values helps us make the right choices as we face today's challenges. Next slide, please. It's good news. Uh, the good news is that many organizations are already taking action on not just protecting, but also using the power of heritage to support wider agendas. If there's an upside to climate change, it's about making us think differently and build new approaches. So the work of the Historic Environment COP26 task group was to focus on the action that they were already being taken to address climate change. Not just about making statements, but having the evidence base to say, look, what you can already do. So we brought together about 50 case studies, and a lot of them just speak for themselves, but also reflect the, the talent, ingenuity, and technical endeavor of so many people working across heritage with partners in academia, government, industry, all striving to play their part. What we found was just how much activity was already underway within the heritage sector and across its partners, and included really cutting edge research led by um, some leading universities to understand the potential impacts and really go into the science of climate change and, and risk assessment. Um, looked into um, technology and, and use of data and AI to record and monitor um, environmental conditions. Advocacy, how we bring people together to debate the issues. We're also looking at carbon reduction, some very active, um, um, lots of activities at the moment for the heritage sector in the UK in particular, trying to cut its carbon base and work and live more sustainably. And we're looking at how lots of buildings have been adapted, not just for the future conservation use, because actually what we're trying to do is, is protect the embedded carbon within those buildings to stop um, that, that carbon adding to the climate change. And using nature-based solutions to thinking about how we work with nature rather than against it and use um, opportunities such as soft capping on ruins, which will help us uh, maintain sites for a long time in changing conditions. But importantly, focus on people, skills. Skills are absolutely critical in terms of the climate debate. We, we're already looking at how to bring people together, to develop their knowledge and think differently and, and get some practical understanding for initiatives like Fit for the Future. Uh, and I've been involved with a scheme called Pro Heritage, which has brought European partners together to look at uh, skills to um, uh, and particularly training up craftspeople to think uh, they can use their knowledge and, and skills to help adapt buildings better. Lots of great work about community engagement and a call out here to the Bishops Council through the Cultural Protection Fund uh, has done fantastic works in, in making sure that community engagement and, and people led approaches were core to their approach for funding. And of course, what this, this conference is about is culture, is how that power of cultural heritage can tell the story of the past and shape our values of the future. Next slide, please. So how do we make heritage part of the solution? Uh, I believe culture and heritage can play a part and, and have an active and positive role in addressing the, the challenge of climate change. If we care about it, we need to show the value of the contribution we can make to the debate. We need to demonstrate real action and commitment to changing how we work, decarbonizing our section, supporting others and making informed decisions. We ourselves need to be open to change in our approaches to cultural protection. We need our role in working heritage and culture to focus more on people as well, helping them make informed decisions about climate change. 
and we need to offer solutions. We need to show how our understanding of the past, our knowledge of the built and natural environment, the power of culture can help society learn how to adapt sustainably, and to draw on the past of contemporary cultures rather than dismiss as a potential blocker to change. To do so, we need to commit. We need to commit to playing our own part within our own section, our own organisations, to make sure that we are, we are living our own values and walking the talk, essentially. Um, and we need to commit to um, supporting people in terms of research, innovation, jobs, skills development, that will help build the resilience to climate change. We need to collaborate. We need to work openly and effectively to share guidance, good practice, practical experience, and lessons learned by the sector. Climate change knows no boundaries, nor should we. And we need to communicate. We need to make the case for why heritage matters and actively participate in the climate change debate, showing how people have coped and adapted in the past and how good heritage management can build the resilience of places and the communities they serve. What heritage response has shown us is as an example of real action gets noticed. I've no doubt that the culture of peace and uh, culture of climate peace seminar will bring us uh, enormous wealth of experience and practice which can help build our case. So let's use that to inspire others. After all, if we can't share, we can't learn. Thank you. Thank you. Um, thank you very much for that uh, wonderful and insightful presentation. And we also, as a conference, do hope to bring out uh, necessary actions. I do have questions for all panelists as well. And I see uh, we do have uh, questions from the chat as well. And we'll address them after our final presentation immediately. So let me introduce our next speaker here. And, sorry, sorry. I think it's just your echo, Julie. Oh, is it better now? Yeah, yeah. Okay, thanks. Thanks, Anthony. Um, okay, so let me please introduce our next speaker and our last talk of the day by Sadat Gunid and Professor Dr. Mahmoud Aydin. Um, Ms. Sadat has, uh, is the president of executive committee of uh, KUMID, which is Friends of Cultural Heritage in, from Istanbul, Turkey. Uh, she has acted as project coordinator for Project for Disaster Risk Reduction in Museums in 2020 and has applied within the scope of Civil Society Organizations Academy Cooperation Support Program, implemented under the support of the European Union and the Civil Society Development Center. She's the lead applicant of the project KUMID and its academic partner was Istanbul University Disaster Res uh, Research Center and with, uh, doc, she's also working currently with uh, Dr. Aydin, who is a member of the KUMID, which is the Friends of Cultural Heritage, and holds a PhD in archaeometry from Middle East Technical University. He works for Batman University as Associate Professor Doctor since 2013. He's also the head of Kelenderi's archaeological excavation site since 2021. He has, uh, under the roof of KUMID, he took charge in many European projects as coordinator and also editor translator in their proceedings, uh, such as European Union cultural heritage legislation and Turkey project, scientific techniques and risk management in museums. They are here today with us to present how to work with multiple actors in times of crisis. They will be talking about samples from the wildfire in Turkey and archeological excavation site of the ancient city of Kelenderis. Ms. Sadat and uh, Professor Ilya, the floor is yours. Thank you, uh, Julie. Uh, dear moderator, moderator uh, speakers and participants, I would like, uh, I greet you from Istanbul on behalf of the co-author and associate, uh, co -author associate professor, Dr. Mahmoud Aydin and our technical team. It is a great honor for us to take part in Climate, Culture and Peace, CCP, virtual event organized by ICROM and British Council. Unfortunately, Dr. Aydin lost his family relative below to one this morning due to COVID-19. Uh, that's, uh, that's why he can't be with us. Uh, let's say the rest in peace. Uh, dear uh, uh, participant, first of all, please let me to summarize our case study on the other world. Our five days experience during the wildfire it is known due to climate change, ranging 
uh, in the southeastern Turkey have caused huge devastation with many people losing their homes and possession and some their lives with many their lives. Those fires uh, also adversely affected the archaeological excavation cities in the region from July and August uh, 2021. One of them was the ancient city, Kalender is located in Aydıncık district, Mersin city on uh, Mediterranean coast of Turkey. Uh, Dr. Aydın, co-author, is also head of the Kalenderis excavation site. During the wildfire, the head of the Kalenderis excavation changed information, take decisions and implemented them by working with the multiple actors just before, during the wildfire. The multiple uh, internal actors in this case study are divided into two, primary actors and secondary actors. They were head of the excavation site of Kalender's ancient city and excavation team, uh, 18 uh, person, uh, are the primary actors. Fortunately, there were no people among them who were difficult to get along with. This could be a different case study for the crisis behavior. Second, uh, secondary actors, we can classify them as a state actors and non-state actors. Likely there were no people among them uh, who were difficult to get along with. Uh, otherwise, this could be a different case study for the crisis behavior. Uh, so state actors uh, were Ministry of Culture uh, and Tourism of the Republic of Turkey and the director of Slifke Museum. Non-state actors were academic civil, civil society organizations such as association to meet our association, volunteers and the other hands of the archaeological excavation in the region. region. Let's note that primary actors had no time to work with the international actors in that case. Study. Therefore, our association as civil society organization made, made public awareness and presentation of all flaws uh, in this case to the internal international actors during the after crisis. Vital lessons learned from case study uh, by working with multiple actors. Lesson one, disaster preparedness knowledge. I would like to share lesson one within the framework of motto, don't take any risk, safety of people is the first. In conclusion, every head of the excavation team should acquire basic knowledge of disaster preparedness and have basic needs to overcome the disaster. Likely, primary actors of this case study have got them. Lesson two, good communication. Second vital lesson learned from case study is to maintain in uninterrupted communication during and after disaster, just, is the, just in case. It is recommended that to have a walkie-talkie at each archaeological excavation site. Other lessons learned from case study. The secret uh, of the success is dealing with the disasters, is to work and communicate calmly in coordination with the primary and secondary actors, both uh, among themselves and with each other, by taking into account the following themes. One, main themes. Teams, governors and humanitarian affairs, identification of priorities, planning and coordination. Sub -teams, teams, good governance and dialogue, disaster preparedness, knowledge, good communication, documentation, and all flows to leave from the history, dedicated actors, and solidarity. Conclusion As a result of our case study, taking into consideration those stamps, Within three hours, preventive conservation measures were taken, the evacuation uh, preparation were completed, and the calendars were ev evacuated within the three hours uh, during the wildfire. After crisis, crisis multiple actors of this uh, case study are intent to work collaboratively with the contribution of the internal actors. Uh, in order to develop and model uh, crisis behavior, as well as future forest fire effects and their possible secondary disasters, such as landslide and flood. Thank you for your uh, patience. Thank you.
Thank you very much, uh, Sadat. This was a wonderful presentation and a great conclusion to our panel in the way that we all need to come and work together and we need more partnerships. We need stronger actors to have a common dialogue in this case. Uh, we have already run quite over time now, but let us address the questions that we have uh, in the chat. Uh, I think the first question is for Dr. Woodside from um, it's Catherine Forbes from Australia, ICOMOS. And she would like to know if there's a report that includes all the case studies. And I see there's already a link for it here. Um, I've just popped it into the into the chat. So it's um, the web links there and it links to the report. And there is an online repository of all the, the case studies as well. It's a it's a GIS story map. So you can track around there. And I think that was a, actually on that note, using GIS was a really useful tool to capture a lot of this quite simply and it, the case studies are limited at the moment to geographically to England but there's no reason we can't build a much broader repository of, of case studies based on on this sort of technology it's very easy and accessible right and um, that's perfect and also I think uh, this brings me to Dr Grady uh, to the question if the, re the interesting report you shared is going to be available to everyone or it's something that uh, is restricted? Thank you. Um, the report, when it's finalised, will be available to everyone. It'll go on a number of websites. It'll go on the Commission's OP website and it'll also go on um, a re research that we have, a sub website as well. And we'll circulate it far and wide because uh, a bit like Rob too, there's going to be an annex with the case studies. Um, as I said, we're collecting case studies, best practice, and we have about 70 at the moment. So we're quite willing to share this information. Thank you. That's wonderful to know. I see we have two heavy-handed questions in the panel that we can address to all the speakers who are at the Ignite today. And we will uh, then conclude with a final question. So I think the first one is from Pauline Regnard in reference to interlocking crisis. So I suppose this is for um, Dr. Bullock. I recall that taking such transdisciplinary approach, recent debates and essays have covered the idea of an impending collapse of industrial civilization within our lifetime is a collapse, however dramatic and sudden, openly discussed within the heritage community at large? And is there a consensus over so-called black swan, which is sudden, unpredictable, unmanageable scenarios? Or are such extreme scenarios still being disputed? Uh, thank you for your question, Pauline. Um, I see that it's really addressed to everyone. So I'll just give my responses. And I'd be really interested to hear what other people say. So my perception is that in heritage, we drill down very deeply using our expertise, and in this case, into climate change. And the point of my presentation was really to try and encourage us to take a broader view of all of the connections between the so-called interlocking crises. Now, I suppose that the unexpected pandemic has caused a number of people to think that maybe didn't agree with the so-called black swan scenario, um, scenarios, that these things can actually happen to us, even uh, when we feel that we're so developed. So I think that the pandemic may be influencing people because it came from uh, left field, but there are so many other possible scenarios. Uh, I'm, I was just trying to look up, I remember, I think it was, uh, there is a geo uh, risk uh, department uh, of the OECD. I remember going to a talk about the uh, probabilities to do with meteorite uh, crashing into the world. Now, these are things that we only see in Hollywood movies uh, for the most of us, but they can happen. So I think my message for heritage in, generally, in general is that 
if we can take a broader view, pay attention to what policy is being made, use our case studies to really influence policy, change the language, the default language that focuses on individual crises. Uh, I'll just add uh, transdisciplinarity. Um, yes, this is technically where you involve people on the ground with the experts. Uh, within the academy, there's interdisciplinarity, which aims to uh, have the different disciplines working better together, even within universities. That has not yet happened. So the best we can do is try and use transdisciplinarity to influence interdisciplinarity, in my view. But I'd really be interested to hear what anyone else has to say on this topic. Um, I, I think if um, archaeology tells us anything that society, that you know societies fail, civilizations fail, but they also evolve. Uh, and and I think that you know actually when you look through you know the history of human experience, it's largely a, a process of of evolution with with um, major events. So I think it's I think that's the value of being able to look back and actually see what's happened in the past and try and track. You know, maybe environmental-led events or conflicts or what have you, but that'll give us the picture. And I think, I think that's what we've got to to you know the old cliche of learning from history to avoid the past. But I think it's try to avoid the the traps of the past or feel you have to go down a certain route. Um, but I think the it's it's about demonstrating the, the relevance and, and value of that that past perspective to help inform the future. Um, and I think I do agree with point about pandemic is like we always talk about big events and unexpected events we're just living through one you know we're living through the biggest impact of uh, that society's faced in 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 you know 70 80 years so i think it's um you know we what can we learn from our response to the pandemic which we can also apply to our response to the climate crisis or ecological crisis you know we found solutions to this one because it had to yeah. we have to find solutions to other crises as well yeah yeah uh, that's that's a good place to start yeah perfect and i think this next question would be in continuation of that that victoria harari is asking us if heritage can help communities during a moment of crisis and what i can add to that is how how does it help uh, communities during crisis and what role do we play as professionals do we really help communities for them do we work for them or do we work with them what it, what does this community-based approach in this moment of crisis really mean and this is again to all the panelists if i i could just come in there and it's a very very interesting question and a, a huge debate around it and i think during the pandemic these last whatever uh, nearly two years now what's very much come across is the importance of a heritage cultural heritage and the associated sense of well-being and people having um, something to appreciate to go to and to learn from and as many of the museums, libraries, archives and heritage sites closed or had limited opening, it put a focus on digitalization, putting their um, collections, digitizing collections, their um, exhibitions, their education programs, and it broadened the sphere even more. So I think uh, at the end of the day, cultural heritage has a, a huge role to play, but it's very much uh, it should be a bottom up approach too. And um, in the commission, what we did it during the first year of the pandemic is we had um, a social media campaign running, encouraging people, encouraging communities to visit the local sites if they're open and to, to become more and more involved. And I think that was very, very um, successful. It was by our commissioner, Gabrielle. And, and the focus should, again, I'm going to say a bottom up approach to get everybody involved. Thank you. Um, Ms. Sadat, do you have an insight uh, on that? Yes. Go ahead. Uh, uh, quick contribution. Yes, uh, in my opinion, thanks to dedicated actors who would like to preserve the cultural heritage, I think. 
For example, thanks to voluntary support of visiting scholar, Associate Professor Dr. Sultan Karolu from Kocaeli University, excavation team, uh, 18 people left Karanderis toward the safe zone with her caravan and private vehicle uh, of head of the Karanderis excavation. Uh, Dr. Karolu was two days together with them and uh, made dangerous travel together with the uh, with her caravan. Uh, I, I, I think this is uh, she is a dedicated one of the dedicated actors uh, who would like preserve the cultural heritage, I think. That's wonderful. So that is what heritage can bring out in a person and it's uh, absolutely beautiful. One last question before we close the session and I think we're half an hour over. So let's say six minutes, a minute to each. Uh, it's a common question to all. What do you think we're missing in, and how do we move forward when we talk about innovation at the forefront when we're trying to make these connections between culture and climate change and peace? What, what is it that we see as a vision, as a next step, as something that we should move forward for innovation? Does this, it can be, is it partnership? Is it research? Is it etc.? cetera? And uh, we can go one by one in the order of, uh, yes, sure. Uh, no, no, sure, yes. Ms. Veronica, go ahead. Hi. Um, I'm afraid I couldn't attend Laura Jane Smith's uh, keynote address, but I'm, I'm very familiar with her work because I did my doctorate in that uh, Centre for Heritage and Museum Studies. Um, so I'd like to pick up on the idea that the meaning of heritage, and partly bouncing off what Anne just said, um, I am always concerned about the monumentality and the institutionalization of heritage. And it's a real problem in Australia. We get accretions on top of that intangible heritage because of our evolving knowledge. Uh, but uh, Laura Jane's point about people make heritage as they go. So if there is a crisis, they don't necessarily have to be taken to the museum except to save their lives. They need to work together find ways through and this becomes new heritage. So uh, to me, I think we need to really alter our policies that define heritage because I think there is also too much compartmentalization in that and it doesn't help with creative uh, solutions for the future for people who especially aren't in heritage and they think it's all just nice stuff. Uh, that's a real problem when you're dealing with uh, state of environment reports. In Australia, heritage is in the state of environment report, but it's it's pretty much all physical with, physical with all those accretions. So I think we have to have a wholesale shift to the ideas that Laura Jane espouses, which is, you know, grassroots. Right. That was actually quite a, one of the most inspiring talks uh, that brought together a lot of ideas that the conference is going for. Um, Dr. Anne, what are your thoughts? I think when you said what is missing, I, I think this, this very panel, this session that we're having here is, is a very good start. And this whole conference over the week is a very good start. And, and what Veronica said there is about sharing and, you know, and collaborating. And, and I think a good start. And the OMC group that I'm, I'm working with, even though it's very much Europe based, again, we're bringing people together and we're trying to find solutions. And I think that's what it's about. Thank you. Great. Mr. Rob would like. You know, uh, well, uh, it goes back to the, the heritage response piece is that there are three things we need to do, which is one is commit. We, we need to commit ourselves to thinking and working differently, be mindful all the time of the potential impacts of climate change and what we do about them. I think it is that collaboration. And I think that collaboration is not just worse working within our own fields, but actually looking out. And I think uh, we need to be able to work with lots of different kinds of um, sectors and organizations to do this we can't do this in isolation and the third bit then Maxon, is the communication 
is actually, you know, we have a voice, we have something to say, we have a contribution to make to this big debate. Um, so, so let's find ways of, of not just talking to each other, as lovely as that all is, is but actually get ourselves under the noses, all the people, the, the key decision makers, and um, to, to be able to, to demonstrate that value. And I think hopefully then sweep up the sort of the, the drive to make a difference on the back of that. That was quite a strong point as well, because uh, something else that is coming out of the conference is the difference in terminology and that climate scientists do not understand heritage professionals and heritage yeah. professionals do not understand uh, people working in the front lines or in the conflict zone. And we will never get to the point we need to get if we all work just in our own tables and offices and uh, sectors. So thank you for that. And uh, Ms. Sadat, your insights, please. Uh, thank you. Uh... A quick uh, contribution. Uh, it is known only the conflicting parties are present on the stage during the armed conflict. In an archaeological area threatened by forest fire, only primary actors are on the stand. No help comes because, uh, uh, because the roads are closed. They have to do everything themselves uh, with the mean of means at their disposal. In this case, uh, they will first ensure their own safety and then to take the necessary measures to protect and evacuate the archeological excavation sites. As a result, the vital lesson learned from our uh, place-based case study, uh, every head of the excavation and team should acquire basic knowledge of disaster preparedness and have a basic needs to overcome to disaster, the disaster. That's perfect. And I suppose exactly half an hour over our session, which is great. And this is a topic we really cannot stop talking about. It's part of a much bigger um, debate, as we said, but thank you so much, dear speakers, for all your time today. I hope you have the chance to join the rest of the day as well. And let's hope we can continue having this kind of conversations and really moving forward with integrating culture in our climate action. Thank you very much. Um, also for everybody else, uh, as we were talking about transdisciplinary, our next session is already in progress which talks about transdisciplinary action to recognize loss and enhance sustainability. The Zoom link is in the chat if you'd like to hop on. And thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Bye. Bye, everyone. Bye. Thank you.